Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics, and um, today we're getting controversial apparently. So I got a $10 donation from F-U-R-O-G-N-A-R, Hugh Rogner. Um, and so in this question, he gets into a topic I've addressed actually before. I'm, I'm going to answer this one not by giving you the answer that you necessarily want, but what I think is the best answer I can give you from the standpoint of what we're trying to achieve here. So it says, what's your take on the height channel versus top ceiling channel debate? If you look at the research by both Wilfred Van Balen of RO3D and by Kimio Hamasaki, creator of the Hamasaki 22.2 format from NHK and part of the MPEG-H format, their research seems to be in agreement that a height channel between 30 degrees and 45 degrees is where human perception of height is optimal. Their research claims that ceiling speakers mounted at higher elevations loses cohesion with their lower level counterparts and are unable to create coherent images between them though separation is greater, more obvious for overhead and flyover effects. In my own experience, I have used both ceiling-mounted speakers and height-mounted speakers at 30-degree elevation, and for four upper-layer speakers, I have found that I have a preference for height mounting over ceiling mounting. Though I am planning for additional top middles to handle overhead effects, I am aware that the 7.1.2 bed object mixes are limited to just the top middles. This doesn't bother me as I lived uh, with 5.1.2 for years. Okay. So... You know, you've cited two people who favor one. I can cite multiple people who favor the other. So Anthony Germani and his research at Dolby and THX had done lots of testing on this. He's also done that as part of his setup of systems. And uh, what they found in their research was actually that the fairly closely spaced together tops overhead uh, gave better. And I think it was because their focus was more on having enough separation for the heights. What he's often cited is that they didn't find that there was very good separation between the uh, side channels, uh, call them at the ear level speakers, and the heights. So they preferred tops, and the tops were actually pretty high up. The angle was pretty extreme. Dolby also did their work as part of the development of Atmos, and the engineers we talked to that were part of that research said that in their experience, they found that having them in the ceiling at the angles they recommended was the best balance and gave a better experience. So having said all that, I think there's something to be said, because there's a lot of work that was done with other surround formats that seemed to suggest that having a three-layer system or more was really the best. And that's, if I was to make an argument, it's that we probably need to move to something that's a multi-layer system that's above two layers. I would argue, but this may be wrong, that Dolby chose the two-layer system that it did for Atmos out of what I think was the highest adoption rate concept. So one of those, well, we have to balance it. The difference in sound is relatively small. And we don't think people are going to be willing to install, like cinemas are going to have to install then an entire extra layer of speakers. So they would have to have the, we'll call them ear level. They're not really ear level, but roughly ear level speakers. They'll have to have that height layer and they'll have to have the top layer. And that they wouldn't be willing to do that. And then homes, it would be even worse. And so they probably didn't go that route because, you know, if we were to try to put a percentage on the difference, it was maybe 5% better or 10% better. And it just wasn't enough to make it worth it even if that's a technically better approach. But I think that the answer to this question comes back to what are we trying to achieve? What we're trying to achieve is an experience in our room that matches what was intended by the creatives. And what was intended by the creatives would be what they mixed. And what they mixed absolutely did not have heights at tops. There is no mixing studio doing Dolby Atmos mixing and here's the thing, you, some of you may say, well, there's some that are putting them out also in RO3D and also in DTSX. So in the US, I don't know of any that are putting out in RO3D. There are ones putting them out in DTSX. They are not monitoring it in DTSX. They actually do it in Dolby Atmos and then they simply uh, convert it. And there's no re-monitoring at the conversion, it's just a conversion. So at least from the major studios, because I don't have access and don't, I don't talk to minor studios putting out small films, but the major studios who I have access to and talk to folks to who are at sound engineers have told me everything is done with Dolby Atmos and it's done to the standards of Dolby Atmos Pro, which means they are using tops, not heights, and that the tops are going to be at the angle that's in the documentation for it. Um, there's obviously a range of angles, but it's going to be within that. So it's your system. You can do whatever you want. And if you want to use heights instead of tops and you find that sounds better, that's for you to decide and that's perfectly okay. But if you want to do a system that matches how this is being done, the top layer should be in the ceiling. That is the correct placement for it per Dolby. That is how all the content you're watching, at least from the U.S., is being monitored. And so that would be the way to do it so that you can reproduce that accurately. 
Now, because of dynamic objects, you can add with Dolby Atmos some heights. The heights are not typically done on the side, they're front and back, um, typically just front, but very, very few processors support that, especially, you know, it's arguable what's the best, most important speakers. But I think that if I was gonna favor something, I would probably do 9.1.6. So if I was gonna go to a system that was a 11, I'm just gonna call it that 11.1.6 type system where we have, it's, I, arguable where the heights fall in there. Maybe they actually should go on the other end of it. 9.1.8 maybe. So you have the six tops, you've got nine here, and then the two heights. It's one of the common installs you could do. The problem is I'm pretty sure the only processor that supports that would end up being a Trinova Storm. I don't think you can do that. I know, I know like Moran's, for instance, will support those channels, but I think it would be, you'd have to choose wide or height. You couldn't do all of them because the channel count would get too high. Um, I know it's a 20 channel processor, but it's uh, four of those are fixed as subwoofers. And then the other 15 are what you have left. So that's that's uh, nine and six. So I'm pretty sure you can't do the heights um, and do the wides. And I think wides are more important than heights. In my experience, we can debate it. So I think the root of your question is, did Dolby err in the decision they made? They might have. I, I actually think that's a fair uh, question. But I think the problem is we're stuck with what we've got. Dolby is the dominant format. And even when you see it coming out in other formats like DTSX, which does have the three layers, um, it doesn't matter because it wasn't monitored that way. And so is it a more accurate way to reproduce it? It's an interesting question. I would love to actually see some stuff. So I was watching something the other day. God, I wish I could remember what the movie was so I could even say that, make this video better if I had specifics. I watched a movie that actually was encoded in DTSX, which is extremely uncommon, but they're not, they exist because I had it. And I remember looking at my uh, phone because the Trinov was reporting DTSX and I'm like, really? That's really weird. And I kept checking things to make sure it, it really was and it was correct. But sure enough, it was. And there is a version, I went and looked, there is a version of it in DTSX and there's a version of it that was in Dolby Atmos. And I think, I'll have to check, I think the version I have had both formats on the um, file. So I, I don't remember now if this is right, but let's pretend it is because it's just a story, right? Um, it would be interesting to set up a system, I'd have to get an Altitude 32, which I don't have, that actually had presets, one for DTSX, for instance, and one for Dolby Atmos. For those of you who are saying, hey, what about RO? There isn't content to use for this, so I it wouldn't be an option. It has to be content that was done that way. Now, the movie I'm watching was almost definitely, probably definitely is the right word here, actually monitored and mixed in Dolby Atmos. And then that conversion was done. It is always possible that that conversion still works so well that the DTSX as a arguably superior format because of the better speaker placement um, would give a better experience. It would be neat to try that where I could have in my room all the speakers I have, add in that extra layer and flip back and forth between the two um, with each optimized. I don't have that ability and I don't, I'd have to really do some work finding content to do that. Adam Pels actually has a room that I think we could do this with. I don't know if he's set it up in such a way where this is possible, but I, I, he and I have talked before about things like doing tests at his house. He's never home, but if he was, um, where you could test things like, is 9.1.6 really audibly better to the point that if you were blinded, you could guess which is which than 7.1.4? I would argue no, but I'm curious. You know, something worth testing. Or how about this? Is... I don't know, an 11.1.8 system audibly better than 9.1.6, better than, you know, 7.1.4. I think it'd be interesting to test whether raising the channel count really does improve notably spatial resolution, or is that just something we say? Um, I think another question would be, would proper playback of content properly encoded in DTSX sound better than proper playback of content properly encoded in Dolby Atmos? Because to me, that's that test you're talking about because DTSX does have the heights, that base layer, and the tops. Um, RO3D would be interesting to test as well. But unfortunately, I don't think it's possible because I don't have content that I'm aware of that was properly encoded and then converted. If any of you are aware of some mainstream content that was done in both Dolby Atmos and RO3D, let me know because I'd be curious and there 
you know, there are there are a couple systems I'm aware of that might be able to test this where they've got the high channel count and lots of speakers and they can be configured in lots of different ways and moved around. Adam's actually, he actually made his so you can move the speakers around and everything. My system, you can't. Um, and I didn't run enough wire to do what I'm saying, but it is something that in hindsight, I kind of wish I had done uh, other than I don't know that I want to pay for that processor. <laughs> Just like you guys don't either. It's a great processor. It's worth all the money it costs. It's just that I uh, am not, I am not the client for that processor. I just happen to be good at setting them up. So anyway, uh, thanks for the question. I get asked this all the time. I know there's some controversy because some folks have indicated that they figured out that Dolby was wrong about their own format somehow. And actually you're supposed to be placing the heights over there because it's better. All I can say is I'm yet to find anybody who would know actually agree with that. So the sound engineers I've talked to think it's ridiculous. The Dolby guys that invented Dolby Atmos, most of which are now retired, have heard that and said it's ridiculous. The um, guys that manage the studios and oversee them think it's ridiculous. The guys that actually put these studios together and place the speakers think it's ridiculous. And the folks that are still at Dolby think it's ridiculous. And all have said the same thing. Stick to what's in the Dolby manual. That's what you need to do. And I had actually, this would be a good video topic. I had a whole, it's kind of philosophical conversation really with a guy that sets up studios. He basically makes sure that they all work properly. He sets them up. He's very, very smart around how to analyze and measure them and make sure they're working properly. And I said, if I want to make my system match what you guys are hearing there when you're mixing them, you know, what's the right way to do? And actually mixing is kind of the wrong word because you don't monitor it as like an Atmos track, you actually monitor it as channels and um, you can hear all the stuff. Like when you are mixing those objects, you can hear what you're doing with it, but it's going to be typically at best. And this is only very recently nine point, I think it's 9.1.4. Um, they, I think they recently made it so you can now start monitoring the wides um, and the extra set of tops. I might even have the extra tops wrong. Maybe it's 9.1.2, but I think it's 9.1.4 that you can now monitor. Um, and then if you want to hear it, like if you're doing a far field mix and you want to hear it the way you would in a, in the cinema, they do actually have all the other speakers. None of them work during the monitoring phase. It's that you have to then basically encode it and then you can play that back and it gets decoded and, and the objects get sent to those speakers. So if let's just pretend that's what you're trying to play back and that's how you're doing it. What he said to me is that what they would hear is actually very, very different from what, what everybody basically is doing at home. First off, the frequency curve that you would use, it wouldn't be an X curve because our, our homes match a near field, not a far field, but it would be something more similar to the X curve than to what most people use. So the high frequencies would be only slightly rolled off, like maybe 2 or 3 dB, which is pretty close to like what the Harman curve kind of recommends and what most people typically do. It wouldn't be the really extreme roll off in the high frequencies that the X curve has, but the base would be dead flat and then there would be nothing done to it but below 20 hertz. There'd be no extending. There'd be actually no significant output below 20 hertz. You know, you might even put a high pass filter in there kind of thing. And so like my system has, I don't know, 4 dB, 5 dB, something like that of rise in the low frequencies. Um, the Dolby music curve, which some people have said is a better curve shape for a home that is a monitoring curve has, I think it's 1 dB of rise in the low frequencies. Um, and then rolls off at 30 hertz. And then the LFE is basically flat. There's no rise to it. And he said to me, that's what your curve should look like. So first off, all the levels need to be matched. Second, the bass needs to be done dramatically differently. And that's what you should be doing. And then speaker placement would need to precisely match that of a near field mixing studio. Because what we're listening to is content, resident. unless you guys happen to have a systems that are DCI capable and you're watching DCI content, what you're listening to on discs are going to be the near field and the near field is mixed in a near field environment. So you'd want to have the speakers in a similar one. Near field doesn't necessarily mean literally near field. You're not like three or four feet from the speakers. Um, they could be very well mixing where they're 12 feet from the speakers, but they're not going to be in the, in the dubbing stages for the cinema. They're going to be significantly like, you know, two or three times that at least from the speakers. Um, all right. So I've talked enough about that. I'm kind of, babbling at this point. Thanks for watching. Thanks for liking uh, when you guys do. Please subscribe. My subscribers have been going up. I kind of killed myself recently with getting COVID and then my wife got overwhelmed and I got overwhelmed with trying to catch up that we didn't get any content out, but we're back at it again. I'm shooting these videos. I got some cool stuff coming. We're going to cover some more of those topics of equipment even I can't afford. <laughs> I say even like I can afford so much, but I just mean like I get to work with this stuff. I get discounts and this is still out of the range of what I can afford, but it's cool stuff. 
It doesn't get reviewed very often, and I want to cover it with you guys. So I've got some stuff coming. Some of it's already here. I'm looking at it. So I'm looking off to the side. Um, some cool projectors, and we're going to get into all sorts of topics from technical explanations of the advantage of these projectors to just what do I think of these projectors compared to the more mainstream stuff that I actually use every day. All right. So uh, come on back for more. I got more videos coming.